connection went down. So this can happen at any moment uh, with no notice. But hopefully I will come back if I disappear. OK, so um, first question I have is whether you can see an handout which I had already posted. I probably think you cannot. Can you see an handout? No, we no, can't. In fact. No, OK, so uh, bear with me for a moment. Because uh, I found uh, a way to post it. Uh, I have to uh, go to another part uh, of Teams. And hopefully, uh, I would like to give uh, to you as well a copy of the handout. So, okay, seems to be working. Can you see it in the chat? Good. So, this is the first good news of my day. And the second one is, uh, let's see whether I can uh, also share my screen. Uh, but that uh, I will do in a moment. So thank you, <clears throat> everybody, for uh, uh, joining in. Uh, and especially, again, uh, people who come uh, from uh, even uh, further than uh, uh, Milan, uh, Dan, uh, uh, no, I see Richard Bloom. So thank you very much. Uh, uh, for uh, joining in. Uh, today I will continue with this uh, exploration uh, of certain uh, features of Leibniz metaphysics uh, that uh, I think uh, will be illuminated uh, if uh, we read them uh, through this uh, lens uh, of a platonic or neoplatonic uh, model of explanation. So there is one thing I would like to clarify at the outset. Uh, which is a follow-up from the discussion we had yesterday, and especially uh, Stefano's um, remarks, Stefano's uh, challenge uh, yesterday regarding uh, is this a really strictly Platonism or Neoplatonism. What I would like to clarify is that uh, uh, what I am doing uh, is different uh, from trying to trace um, the sources uh, of Leibniz. So what I am doing is not to say uh, here there is uh, this idea about the one, say let's try to see from uh, which book or uh, which set of books uh, is Leibniz taking it. Uh, is this the Parmenides or is this uh, a compendia or is, is this a set of compendia, is this a Goclenius? Uh, this, this is uh, a very important uh, um, thing to do. But it's not what I am doing uh, with this uh, set of lectures. Uh, what uh, I am doing uh, with this uh, is uh, to, um, I speak of uh, Platonism or Neoplatonism as uh, a metaphysical model of explanation. What uh, I would like uh, to emphasize is that Leibniz find himself uh, in a, in a place, in a culture, in a time in which there are some fundamental metaphysical alternative floating around. He, he reads Descartes, he reads Spinoza, he reads uh, Locke, and uh, he reads uh, in some form uh, Plato, uh, the Neats, uh, he reads the Compendia. There are, uh, as a result of this, uh, certain fundamental metaphysical alternatives. And myself, I take the view that uh, in, in metaphysics, uh, there are only a handful of genuine alternatives. Either you are going to be a monist or you are not going to be a monist. Either you are going uh, to, um, to have a top-down explanation uh, as the most uh, uh, important uh, order of explanation uh, in uh, your metaphysics, or you are going to have uh, a bottom-up model of explanation. So, so is this a sort of things uh, I am uh, trying to trace, uh, not which sources uh, Leibniz actually used in order to speak, uh, say, 
of the hypercategorimatic infinite and so on. So that is uh, uh, the, the main thrust of the talk, although, of course, the um, tracing, the sources tracing, the sort of thing Leibniz was reading, reading and so on, is equally and uh, in a certain sense underpins uh, the, 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 the sort of uh, um, re trying to account for a certain metaphysical model which uh, I am uh, doing. Okay, Mar Maria okay, Rosa, so I apologize. I have to interrupt you because nobody can actually um, download the file you posted. So oh. neither okay. n download it uh, nor uh, read it or open it in any way. Um, so uh, ah, we, we, right. we can't use it. Okay, so uh, I'm afraid that this was uh, the only uh, method I found, but uh, I am going to um, to share it. Okay to my screen okay, so, so you can follow it and follow it okay, and uh, as I uh, said yesterday this is an handout based uh, on a paper which I have uh, uh, published in Studia Leviniziana in a volume uh, edited by Arnaud Pelletier uh, who is here with us so if you want to have uh, the full uh, uh, apparatus of references of test uh, it is there and uh, if uh, you want to have the handout, uh, just drop me an email uh, and uh, I can email it to you. So unfortunately, for some reason, uh, the, the, the method I normally use uh, to share uh, files uh, does not seem to be working uh, uh, on this uh, iteration of uh, Teams. I don't know why. Anyway, I will now share my screen. Okay, can you see it? Can you see the screen? Yes, yes, of course, thanks. Yeah, okay, so. So yesterday I discussed the divine infinite in particular. Today I will tackle uh, these, uh, uh, these issues from a, another perspective, uh, that is the perspective of primary matter and what is a primary matter for Leibniz. At the end of his illuminating discussion of Leibniz's notion of primary matter, Bob Adams raises a question to which he suspects Leibniz himself did not attend carefully. And this is the question. Is a primary matter a positive constituent of a substance, something which must be added to a substantial form to constitute a complete substance? Or is it simply the set of limitations characteristic of a particular substantial form, and those merely the expression of something that has not been added? or included in the form. Well, uh, what uh, I will uh, argue is that uh, Leibniz's uh, considerate answer in his mature metaphysics uh, would be that uh, primary matter is not a positive constituent which must be added to the form in order to have uh, a substance. I will argue that for Leibniz, primary matter is merely a way to express the negation of some further perfection. It does not have a positive ontological status. It's not a thing, it's not even a positive ontological constituent, and merely indicates the limitation or imperfection of a substance. What uh, I will argue is that uh, for Leibniz, primary matter is simply a way to describe the fact that uh, in uh, uh, created uh, substances, uh, perfection uh, is uh, limited. Now, to be sure, Leibniz is less than explicit on this point, and that is why Bob Adams raises that question. And in many texts, he writes as if primary matter 
were a positive constituent of a substance. Of a substance. So um, there will be tests that you can point uh, um, to me in which it seems uh, that Leibniz is saying uh, that uh, um, primary matter is a positive ontological constituent. It seems to me, however, that uh, the view most in keeping with the trust of his mature uh, metaphysical system is that captured by a striking remark of 1695. And the remark is this. Materia rerum est nihilum, id est limitatio. The matter of things is nothing. That is a limitation. I will argue that this becomes especially apparent in texts showing that Leibniz's conception of primary matter corresponds to his uh, conception uh, of creature li limitation. OK, so this is uh, the uh, structure now of the talk in which I will try to make my case. I will start uh, by discussing the notion of primary matter in the scholastic tradition. Uh, I will be looking at uh, uh, certain uh, views about uh, um, primary matter, especially in Aquinas and uh, Dance Scotus, and I will br very briefly speak about uh, Occam and, uh, um, and Suarez. I then show that although Leibniz places uh, the scholastic terminology of primary matter at the crucial juncture of his metaphysics, uh, he thinks of primary matter in a way which significantly deviates from earlier scholastic views. I conclude that despite his adoption of distinctive terminology of Aristotelian scholasticism, instead of holding a broadly Aristotelian conception of primary matter, as the ultimate subject of inherence of the forms, Leibniz thinks of primary matter according to a neoplatonic blueprint in which matter is a non-being, privation, mere absence of perfection. So the claim is that although Leibniz often presents this uh, talk of primary matter in an uh, scholastic Aristotelian terminology, in fact, uh, deep down uh, at heart, uh, his view of primary matter is not really Aristotelian, uh, is uh, really a neoplatonic blueprint, blue, blueprint. So this is the plan. And now let's start uh, with the first section, uh, primary matter in the scholastic tradition. And uh, I look, first of all, uh, uh, briefly at Aquinas and simplicity and the primary matter as a pure potentiality. Now for Aquinas, uh, and here he is in, a, in good company um, with a lot of other people, uh, in order to be a substance, uh, an entity must be unum per se. Obviously Leibniz agrees with that. Aquinas maintains that nothing one per se has more than one constituent with an actuality of its own. It follows that for composites of form and matter to qualify as substances, only one constituent can have an actuality of its own. According to Aquinas, this is, in this is in fact the case since a primary matter receives uh, all its actuality from the form. Of itself, a primary matter is a pure potentiality. And uh, as such, uh, it cannot uh, exist uh, apart uh, from uh, the composite. So insofar as beings one per se do not have parts which are metaphysically prior to the whole composite and they have only one constituent with 
its own actuality, the substantial form, they imitate in the relevant way the absolute simplicity of God. As you will know, for Aquinas, God's simplicity is really one of the key tenets. God is altogether simple. And if there is a, something, a, a being which counts as a substance, uh, that has uh, uh, got to be at least God. Uh, and uh, therefore, uh, created uh, substances uh, needs to imitate in a relevant way the absolute uh, simplicity of God. Of course, they are not uh, altogether simple, uh, but this is the way in which they can uh, imitate uh, the simplicity of God. Uh, there are uh, no parts. Uh, which are metaphysically prior to the whole composites, uh, and uh, they would be so if a part had uh, its own form. But there is only one form uh, for the whole uh, composite, uh, and uh, primary matter is uh, in itself a pure potentiality. As we will see, Leibniz's mature metaphysics uh, can be interpreted, in my, uh, in my view, as taking this intuition to its extreme, uh, and most rigorous uh, consequences. So what about the later scholastics? Well, uh, the later scholastics uh, are uh, quite different. To start from dance cultures, uh, for dance cultures, primary matter must be a positive entity, really distinct, that is uh, separable from the form. And why does Scotus think so? Because uh, he finds it contradictory to maintain both that the primary matter is part of a composite and yet that it does not have a positive being of its own. If it does not have a positive being of its own, Scotus reasons, it is a non being. And as such, it cannot be a constituent part of a composite if it is ontologically non being. In fact, he continues, if matter were not a positive principle, there would be no composite substances at all, but only simple substances. We will see how that ends up with Leibniz. However, in an Aristotelian framework, Scotus reasons, substances must be composed since this very composition explains the change of which generation and corruptions are instances. So the reasoning is, well, if uh, um, there were not composite substances, there would be no generation and corruption of created substances. Once again, we will see how that ends up with Leibniz. Change needs a recipient matter and the receptum, the form, which are really distinct from one another. So in short, Scotus' key objection against Aquinas' conception of primary matter is that matter conceived as a pure potentiality is uh, nothing, nihil. I quote from Scotus, if you want to have a proper pure potency, without any act, you will have nothing, as in privation without a subject. So now very briefly, I just mentioned it, Occam in this respect agrees with Scotus in seeing a primary matter as a positive principle with an actuality of its own. Suarez uh, as well uh, thinks uh, of pri that primary matter as an existence of its own. Although it does not naturally exist in its, on its own uh, and is always naturally found in conjunction uh, with some form or another, it is uh, logically and metaphysically possible for God uh, to preserve a primary matter without any form uh, inhering in it. So there is a logical and metaphysical possibility there, although naturally that doesn't happen. We will uh, see that Leibniz uh, denies uh, this uh, logical and metaphysical possibility for God uh, to preserve a primary matter. 
or to change the primary matter of a simple substance. So what about Leibniz? Now, Leibniz is a certainly closer to Aquinas' view that matter is pure potentiality and as such cannot exist without any form or another inhering in it. Then to the later scholastics who see matter as a positive ontological principle with an actuality of its own and capable of existing without any substantial form inhering in it. Or at least this is my claim. However, he is much more radical than Aquinas. And these are my claims, and then I will try to support this claim, these claims with some key texts. As Scotus and Occam had pointed out, conceiving primary matter as pure potentiality leads to the identification of primary matter with non-being. Leibniz does not recoil from such a conclusion and either deny that the primary matter is pure potentiality, as Scotus and Occam had done, or at the, at the opposite end, deny that pure potentiality is a mere non-being, as Aquinas was trying to do. Instead, I argue, his considered position is in line with the conclusion that the primary matter, being a pure potentiality, is a non-being. In short, in my view, Leibniz moves away from the Aristotelian framework of primary substances as a composites of two positive ontological constituents form a matter of which matter is the ultimate subject of inherence, moves away from that despite the Aristotelian language toward a more frankly neoplatonic or more precisely Plotinian framework in which matter is identified with non-being and even with evil. The latter claim resonates in Leibniz's notion of metaphysical evil, which will be the topic of my next talk. So let's uh, try to look at some tests uh, and uh, um, see where, how this uh, pans out in these uh, texts. So primary matter, passivity, and body's resistance uh, and uh, inertia. Let's begin uh, from the famous account of the layers of his ontology given uh, by Leibniz to the boulder. Uh, if you are a Leibniz specialist, uh, you will know this uh, passage by heart. It's like uh, one of the, as it were, it's really the Bible and the Gospel, the Quran, everything packed there. I distinguish, therefore, one, the primitive entelechy or soul, two, matter, i.e. primary matter, or primitive passive power, three, the monad, completed uh, by these two. For the mass or secondary matter or organic machine for which countless subordinates monads come together. Five, the animal or corporeal substance which is made one by the monad dominating the machine. Now I will be looking in particular at the first three layers of Leibniz ontology, one, two and three. And I will say something briefly about the secondary matter in order to distinguish it from primary matter. I will not go into the very uh, much discussed issues uh, whether there are uh, in Leibniz corporeal substances uh, in a strict sense. Leibniz identifies primary matter with the primitive passive power of a substance. Indeed, in a letter to Bernoulli of 1698, primary matter is exhaustively explained in terms of passivity. 
Leibniz writes, when I said that the primary matter is that which is merely passive and separate from source and forms, I said the same thing twice. That is, it is just as if I had said that it is merely passive and separate from all activity. So primary matter is exhaustively explained in terms of passivity. From primary matter conceived as a passivity or primitive passive power or primitive force of resisting spring some fundamental properties of, of bodies, namely impenetrability, resistance and uh, inertia. Now I will uh, not uh, um, read uh, this whole uh, passage, uh, as I said, uh, is a uh, either in the published paper or I can uh, um, email to you the handout if you want it. And I will not uh, read out this long passage either. I will just uh, mention that in the specimen, the specimen dynamicum of 1695, the primitive force of resisting action identified with the scholastic notion of primary matter is, according to Leibniz, uh, the source of the impenetrability of bodies and their uh, inertia. Inertia conceived uh, as in Kepler, so this is a Keplerian inertia, as a resistance uh, of bodies uh, to motion. So what Leibniz is saying is that uh, there is uh, this uh, uh, primitive uh, uh, passivity, there is uh, this uh, um, primary matter cause it, or um, this uh, um, primitive passive power, the manifestation of which uh, are uh, certain uh, features uh, in bodies, uh, such as uh, inertia, resistance of body to motion. Okay, so Let's go the next step, and I, I will uh, read uh, with you this uh, longer passage, because uh, I will uh, now try to see the relationship between primary matter, primitive passive power, and uh, creaturally limitation. Because I am going to argue that a prim primary matter, which Leibniz thinks uh, should be interpreted as a primitive passive power, is uh, nothing else uh, than uh, creaturally limitation. So Leibniz writes, uh, and this passage is from the Theodicy. They celebrated Kepler, and after him, uh, Mr. Descartes in his letters, uh, ever spoken of the natural inertia of bodies. And it is something uh, which may be regarded uh, as a perfect image and even a, a sample of the original limitation of creatures. So not just an, an image, but a sample, an example of the original limitation of creatures. To show that the privation constitute the formal nature of the imperfections and disadvantages to be found in substance as well as in its actions. So here there is an, uh, a first important claim I would like to stress uh, that uh, the formal nature of imperfections uh, is a uh, privation, uh, lack of being. Let us suppose, uh, and here is the example uh, which returns in a number of, on a number of texts, an example uh, taken from physics. Let us suppose uh, that uh, the current uh, of one and the same river carried along with its various boats, which differ amongst themselves only in the cargo, some being laden with wood, some with stone, some more, the others less. That being so, it will come about that the boats most heavily laden will go more slowly than others provided that it is assumed that the wind or the oil or other similar means assist them not at all. It is not, properly speaking, weight 
which is the cause of this retardation. Since the bolts are going downward and not upward, so it is not weight per se which makes them go more slowly because they are going down, uh, downwards. It is the form matter itself which originally is inclined to slowness or privation of speed. Again, here the important word is privation. Not indeed uh, through the lessening of this speed, uh, once it has uh, already received it, uh, since uh, that uh, would be acting. So Leibniz is keen to say this is not an action uh, by those uh, boats. It's the privation of something. It's not uh, that uh, the, this boat uh, actively somehow they are uh, uh, they are uh, making itself go more slowly in an active way. This he is quite keen to say, no, this is not what is happening. So not indeed to the lessening of this speed uh, once it has already received it, since that will be acting, uh, and uh, here we are not dealing with acting, uh, but uh, through moderating by its receptivity the effect of the impression, impression uh, when it is to receive it. Consequently, more uh, matter is moved uh, by the same force of the current when the boat is more laden. Uh, it is necessary that it go more slowly, etc., etc. So let me skip uh, this bit. Uh, what is saying uh, this natural inertia is a kind of repugnance uh, to being moved, to being moved. Let us now compare the force uh, with uh, the current. Uh, uh, sorry, let us now compare the force uh, which the current exercises on both and communicates to them uh, with the action of God who produces and conserves whatever is positive in creature and gives them perfection of being and force. Let us compare, I say, the laden boat with the defect to be found in the qualities and the action of the creature. And we shall find that there is nothing so just as this comparison. The current is the cause of the boat's movement not of its retardation. God is the cause of the perfection in the nature and the actions of the creatures, but the limitation of the receptivity of the creature is the cause of the defect there are in its action. Thus, the Platonist, St. Augustine and the schoolmen were right to say that God is the case of the material aspect of evil, which consists in the positive, and not uh, the formal aspect of evil, which consists in uh, privation. So the formal nature of evil is to be a privation, uh, and uh, this is, uh, Leibniz is keen to say, this has nothing to do with action. Uh, the only action, uh, the only positive force uh, here is uh, the, the force of the current uh, bringing uh, uh, bringing the boat along uh, with it, uh, and uh, the, what happens is that uh, the boat uh, is not uh, um, receptive uh, to some extent uh, to that uh, to that action. Now, this uh, picture is a very familiar one, uh, not only in Leibniz, but uh, as Leibniz says, uh, in the Platonist, uh, Saint Augustine, uh, and the Schoolman. So we, you find uh, the same uh, sort of. Uh, Example uh, in uh, other texts, uh, you have there the indication. Uh, so to sum up, uh, inertia and uh, resistance uh, are uh, derivative uh, features uh, in uh, bodies uh, of the primitive passivity, which is an aspect of all created uh, substances due to the necessary imperfection uh, and the uh, limitation of creatures qua creatures. Leibniz's notion of primary matter, I argue, is at bottom nothing else than his notion of creature limitation. So as a limitation, his formal nature is not that of being something, 
is that of being a privation of something. Now, some kind of replies to the interpretative picture that I am presenting. That is, uh, they claim that uh, primitive passive force uh, or a primary matter is not uh, something, uh, is not uh, a force doing something, uh, but uh, is merely a privation of something else. So one could object, uh, well, wait a moment, uh, primary matter as a primitive passive power as uh, its own uh, fundamental metaphysical operation. So if it is a uh, power, it can hardly be nothing. If uh, it has its own uh, fundamental metaphysical operation, uh, it uh, can hardly be just uh, a privation. Now, here we have to pause for a moment uh, and look uh, at the metaphysics of powers. So bear with me for a moment. So it seems to me that the proper powers, precisely insofar as they do something, they can only be active powers. It seems to me that a genuine power is the capacity to produce certain outcomes. On the contrary, the ability or capacity to be acted on, to be affected or affected, does not seem to be to be properly described as a power to do something. It is an ability, it is a disposition, but I don't think it is properly a power. Power, insofar as they are powers, they can only be active, they can only do something. So what I am claiming is that, properly speaking, there is not such a thing as a passive power. Insofar as a power is a power, it has to be active. It has to be able to do something. And uh, here I broaden myself a bit. It seems to me that uh, this uh, has uh, a root uh, in the ambiguity in the, uh, in the notion of uh, potentia, because a potentia can uh, both uh, be uh, regarded as uh, pure potentiality, or it can be as potentiality, potentia, or uh, it can be regarded uh, as a uh, uh, power. It seems to me that in both cases uh, they are dispositions, but uh, not all uh, dispositions are uh, powers. To give you um, another example, it seems to me that although um, we speak routinely of something like uh, fragility is the power of a glass to break, uh, it seems to me that uh, this is an improper way of speaking. And uh, it seems to be that rather than an ability of the glass to break, we should uh, speak of a liability of the glass to break. The glass is not doing anything, it's not able on its own to do anything and just break, but it is liable of breaking if there are some active forces, some real powers of some kind. Uh, acting on it. So that is what I, I suggest that in conclusion, passive powers are not genuine powers. They are merely a way to express the limitation or negation of some further perfection of the active forces, precisely as primary matter merely expresses the limitation or imperfection of a creature. So the second objection uh, you could present to me is that the creature limitation is uh, the cause of the defects which are in the actions of creatures. 
uh, Leibniz uses this word uh, cause. Well, uh, again, I think here that uh, we, we should uh, uh, look closer. And it seems to me that when Leibniz is speaking of creaturally limitation as the cause of the defect, uh, which are uh, in the action of creatures, is using the notion of cause in an extended, in an extended sense. Uh, the more precise uh, uh, notion uh, at work here is uh, the notion of a reason uh, rather than a cause. And the Leibniz uh, does have uh, this uh, distinction, and this is a distinction uh, which becomes uh, uh, crucial uh, in his uh, philosophical theology, uh, because uh, uh, Leibniz uh, uh, would uh, say that uh, there is no cause of God uh, or God's existence, uh, but there is a, a reason of God's existence, and, and that is a completely different claim. So it seems to me that uh, um, this is what is going on here. The creaturely limitation is really the reason of the defect rather than the cause. And of course, uh, we can speak in a, in a, in a broad way of causes. Uh, one can say that the cause of my arriving last at the race, something which always happens to me, is uh, my slowness, uh, but uh, slowness uh, is uh, really not uh, some positive active force uh, which is pulling me back uh, from uh, uh, going fast. It's simply a way to describe that, that I have uh, the ability, the power to uh, run at a certain speed, uh, which uh, is more limited uh, than uh, the positive ability to run at a certain speed uh, of other of other uh, participant in this race. So it seems to me this is what uh, is going on uh, in this case. OK, last but not least, one could still say the active without the passive, or the passive without the active is incomplete. They are, therefore, uh, two ontologically positive constituents needed to make a complete being. One could say, isn't that what Leibniz is saying in the famous layers of his ontology? Well, I think, again, we have to look closer, and it seems to me that is a distinctio rationis. That is, Leibniz is abstracting to a distinctio rationis a feature which is uh, not uh, really distinct, only to explain uh, how things work, but is not uh, really distinct. That is uh, an uh, abstraction by a distinctio rationis. And it seems to me that uh, this is uh, bared out uh, by some key tests I would like to uh, briefly mention now. The first one is a letter to Bernoulli. Now, Bernoulli says uh, to Leibniz, well, wait a moment. Uh, if you are saying that uh, uh, substances without uh, passive power, without primary matter, are, uh, uh, or without potentiality, are incomplete, are you saying that God is incomplete? Because God is purus actus, uh, pure act. There is no uh, um, potentiality, so is God incomplete? Leibniz says, no, no, God doubtless is a pure act, a purus actus, since he is most perfect. But imperfect things are passive. And if we conceive them otherwise, they are taken incompletely. So uh, the way I read this is uh, the way in which we are conceiving them. We have to conceive them as uh, incomplete uh, if we do not uh, take into consideration uh, their aspect uh, of limitation. And it seems to me this is uh, um, consistent uh, with uh, another striking claim of Leibniz uh, to Arnold, that is uh, that matter is always essential uh, to the same uh, substance. Why? Leibniz and primary matter is always essential to the same substance because it is merely a way to consider, once again, or to conceive or to describe the limitation of that substance. 
So it's not that one can take and keep uh, the active uh, power of that uh, substance fixed uh, and then add just a little bit more uh, primary matter or take away a little bit more primary matter. Because a primary matter or primitive passive power is just a way to describe the, the limitation of that active power. And it seems to me that is the point Leibniz is making to the boss in 1706, concerning the question of whether an entelechy may change matter, I draw the following distinction, as you write, I have already done. An entelechy change, change, changes its organic body or secondary matter, but does not change its own primary matter. So it's okay to change the organic body, the secondary matter, which as we know from the layers of Leibniz ontology in the, the boss letter we read at the beginning, is an aggregate of monads. Indeed, we know that that changes continuously, but what cannot change is its own primary matter. Mr. Bale does not seem to have understood my opinion about this well enough. Poor Mr. Bale does, never seems to get it according, according to Leibniz. Primary matter is essential to any entelechy and is never separated from it. Since it completes it and it is itself the passive power of the entire complete substance. Therefore, although God, who is absolute power, could deprive a substance of secondary matter, he nevertheless cannot deprive it of primary matter, for from this he would produce a pure after as himself alone is. So what Leibniz is saying is that that is a logical and metaphysical impossibility. That is why not even God can do the impossible, not even God can do what is logically and metaphysically impossible. And why is a logical and metaphysical impossibility? Because it is just a way to describe the limitation of that active power which constitute that limited substance. So, at least this is how I propose to interpret it. In sum, primary matter and primitive passive power as a corresponding to creaturely limitation is not a something, a positive ontological constituent added to form to make a substance, but merely a way to indicate that creatures lack further perfection. That is a way to indicate that there are degrees of active power of, or activity which creatures do not have. And here I come back to this uh, uh, quotation from uh, this uh, um, test of six, um, this text, uh, which I was already mentioning at the beginning, being positive or actuality and the restriction or the privative, so the privative, are in beings like metaphysical form and metaphysical matter. And thus, the matter of things is nothing that is a limitation. Their form is a perfection. So I claim that this also helps explaining why Leibniz from 1695 onwards comes to think of simplicity as the single property which best capture what it is in metaphysical rigor to be a substance. I mean, if you are a Leibnizian, you will know that Leibniz does not speak of monads in his, uh, in his uh, specific uh, metaphysical sense before 19, uh, 1695, does not speak of simple substances before that. He has given an account of what it is to be a substance in terms of unity, in terms of activity, but it is rather late that he comes to think, ah, I got it. Just simplicity, that will get what it is to be a substance, that capture all the rest. Why would he think so? Well, here is my suggestion. 
as Aquinas had maintained, something that is uh, one per se as a substance must be in order to qualify as a substance, uh, cannot have more than one constituent uh, that has uh, an actuality of its own. As for Aquinas, matter in composite substances is a pure potentiality which receives all its actuality from the form. Scotus challenged such a position, pointing out that it is inconsistent to think of primary matter as not having an actuality of its own and yet being a constituent of a composite. If it is pure potentiality, Scotus points out, it is a non-being. And as a result, there is no such a thing as a composite of two positive ontological constituents. It seems to me that Leibniz pushes these thoughts to their extreme consequences. He maintains, like Aquinas, that an entity one per se can only have one constituent, which has an actuality of its own, the form or entelechy or active power. But unlike Aquinas, and in line with Scott's objection, he concludes that if the other so-called constituent matter does not have an actuality of its own, it can only be non-being. If this is the case, then any entity which is one per se is not and cannot be a composite being. Any entity which is which strictly qualifies as one per se and therefore as a substance is a simple being. That is why simplicity comes to be so central in life in its metaphysics of substance. Now, as uh, we have uh, seen above, uh, Scotus had already noted that if matter were not a positive principle, there would be no composite substances, but only simple substances. And Scotus says, no, 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 that cannot be, because otherwise, how are we going to explain uh, change uh, and uh, generation uh, and corruption? For that, we need a composite substance. Well, uh, that reasoning resonates in a striking way in the monadology, but uh, turned uh, upside down. Leibniz says, uh, no, to be a substance, to be unum per se, you need uh, to be simple. And of course, uh, simple substances uh, cannot corrupt, uh, cannot be generated. So these uh, simple substances uh, are metaphysically primitive uh, due to the absence of any dependence uh, on parts or constituents uh, which could be regarded as prior to the whole. If there were parts uh, which are separable, uh, they would be metaphysically prior to the whole uh, which is uh, constituted by these parts and which is uh, dependent on these parts. In the program of ontological mi minimalism pursued by Leibniz, this is exactly what he had been looking for the metaphysically primitive level of being to which everything else can be reduced. And now I come to my conclusion. So bear with me a, a little bit more. Five minutes or so. Leibniz considered the view in his mature metaphysics is that the matter of things is nothing, that is limitation. Its formal nature is to be lack of being, is to be privation, is to be non-being. For Leibniz, primary matter is a noun, a term to describe the limitation of the only one actual constituent of simple, that is metaphysically primitive substances. This has momentous consequences for Leibniz's theory of substance. At the most fundamental ontological level in Leibniz's system, there is a no matter as a, some sort of being, thing, stuff, rest to be combined with form 
entelechy, activity, and primitive active force. And that is, I think, why sometimes Leibniz in his mature metaphysics, uh, it just go off, uh, goes off uh, to speak uh, of monads as entelechy, as activity, just uh, um, as a way to say, well, this is what is really there. Now, question. Is Leibniz doing away with the sensible world, the world that we experience? My answer is uh, no. In eliminating primary matter as a thing and less, Leibniz is not eliminating the facts of our experience of the world as in contrast with extension, impenetrability, so, um, solidity, resistance, that is the facts of the corporeal world. Leibniz uh, is interested in the corporeal world. He wants to explain uh, what it is. What he's doing uh, is uh, reducing these uh, facts, uh, which are not denied, uh, is reducing these facts to facts about uh, simple substances uh, with uh, limited uh, degrees of perfection, limited degrees of perception, uh, limited uh, degrees of active powers. He is not saying that these empirically observable facts are illusions, but uh, that they are phenomena bene fundata, well-founded phenomena, expressing uh, something which is ultimately real. In sum, uh, this is uh, Leibniz's Occam razor ruthlessly cutting away any reducible entia in favor of minimal ontological commitments. So to wrap up and to go back to the uh, angle from which we are seeing uh, these uh, issues uh, in this uh, set of talks, uh, it seems to me that Leibniz in his uh, conception of primary matter, despite uh, the language of Aristotelian uh, scholasticism, has moved away from uh, a genuinely, uh, from, from a, a, let's call it broadly, Aristotelian framework uh, as uh, with matter as uh, the substance of inherence of forms uh, towards uh, a neoplatonic model uh, in which uh, primary matter is ontologically non-being. So it's not, it does not have any positive ontological uh, uh, status. It is a way to describe limitation that is to say formally lack of being. So that is it. Thank you very much for bearing uh, with me faithfully uh, for so long. And uh, uh, what I suggest uh, to do is that, uh, is that uh, we break uh, again uh, for five minutes uh, and uh, we reconvene uh, at, in five minutes uh, and uh, we have a discussion uh, then uh, we break again because uh, uh, today I would like also to introduce at least uh, um, the, the next topic, which is a metaphysical evil, and we might or might not be able to discuss it, uh, but we have time uh, tomorrow to do some of that discussion, uh, and then uh, tomorrow I will conclude uh, with uh, pure positivity, which seems to me draws together all, uh, all uh, these, uh, these things. Okay, so, well, thank you for listening and uh, uh, see you in uh, five, uh, five minutes. Maria, 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 can, can you stop, can you the, stop recording? the recording? I can stop the recording, yes. Thank you.